Um, that looks good. Can everybody see? Cool. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to be presenting a sensitivity analysis framework for use within uh, MICs. Um, this work came from uh, uh, learning that I that uh, was underwent during my master's program um, with my supervisors Lucy Conover and Tommy Wilkinson. Um, oh, bit of background. So basically. Uh, we thought about how, as MICs move towards the principles of universal health coverage, um, this will obviously incur a greater demand for health economic evaluation. Um, in addition, uh, we can also consider the fact that NCDs are expected to rise dramatically within these jurisdictions within the next decade, um, which will place even greater burden on already strained healthcare budgets. Um, so the general rationale for creating this framework was the fact that on top of uh, the uh, four background, um, MIC analysts are often forced to use uh, uh, generalized evidence because we often lack access to high quality data. Um, other methods such as different types of costing approaches um, or restricting your evidence base has also been suggested. Um, but we believe that this was quite obviously restricted um, and didn't allow for a, uh, a a comprehensive uh, um, view of the decision problem. Um, but there's also a complementary problem, which is the fact that we also face uh, a lot of shortage in skills and research capacity. Um, and then in this sense, time is of the essence when it comes to more complex modeling methods. Um, so we applied a case study um, and uh, it was basically used um, to, uh, sorry, can is that background noise disturbing? I apologize about that. Um, but uh, it was basically used to get an idea of the pros and cons of uh, applying a more comprehensive modeling approach within MIC climates. Um, by comprehensive, we mean basically fully Bayesian, where you embed a statistical model within your decision model. Um, and so the potential pros and cons of, of this aspect within MICs is that you can obviously reflect uh, uncertainty to a greater degree, um, and you're also able to incorporate all, or try to incorporate as much evidence as possible. On the flip side, uh, this obviously requires more advanced skills, as has been touched on, and uh, this obviously incurs the opportunity for greater modeling error. Um, and also, it obviously, well, it uh, desires uh, purpose-specific software. So we replicated a model that was originally deterministic, um, and our results showed that uh, the comprehensive approach basically reduced the costs, the estimated costs of the status quo treatment and increased the costs, uh, costs of the alternative. And this was vice versa for benefits. Um, and it resulted in basically uh, an ISO of about $1,000 more than the original model. Um, but nevertheless, uh, a model with 30 health states, a uh, Markov model, still ran consistently less than a minute. Um, but this did take 2,000 lines of code. And I think the most important finding of our case study was that although this was a really great approach and it offered great flexibility in terms of what you could do, um, it didn't actually practically change the decision. Um, so based on this uh, finding, our framework basically advocates for bang for buck ideology um, based on a redefinition of Occam's razor, uh, laser, uh, well, a redefinition of the laser. Um, and it basically rests on several features, uh, specifically decision-maker preferences, analytical considerations, and the policy context. Um, for example, with decision power, we discuss whether the decision-maker is able to delay a decision or not, um, and incorporate ideas such as value of information analysis. Um, with investments, we talk about how high investments obviously incur higher opportunity costs, and therefore within the context of MICs, it's important to think about the trade-offs between simpler DSA methods versus probabilistic methods. Um, and then obviously risk preference, we usually assume that decision makers are risk neutral, um, but we think it's important to incorporate the idea of you know, including risk aversion. Um, and then con analytical considerations, we discuss available resources which is basically the time constraints of the analyst and their skills toolbox. Um, and then indirect evidence. 
specifically how much indirect evidence is used for the analysis and whether, uh, and if that's so, then it's probably better to use probabilistic methods. And then finally, policy context. This is about, uh, this reflects the decision maker's knowledge of the topic and their technical expertise and considers how different models will be uh, uh, accepted by different decision makers in terms of their own knowledge level. Um, but the overarching purpose of our framework can basically be thought of as thinking about the time constraints and the resource constraints of the MIC context, and then to relate these different approaches to sensitivity analysis to different software. So relating this back to HDA, uh, well, R for HDA, um, com uh, comprehensive modeling obviously uh, uh, provides advantages. Um, and so if you need more advanced techniques such as evidence synthesis or value of information analysis, and you want a probabilistic uh, sensitivity analysis on top of that, we strongly advocate in the fra framework for using uh, languages such as R, um, specifically because this is, uh, R can just produce this more uh, easily and um, it's just more time efficient. Um, but again, this all depends on whether it's actually understood and received by the decision maker. But um, to end off, I'd also just like to say that the point of the framework is to try uh, incorporate or to provide a reference for decision makers and analysts to communicate um, and to, in that way, try encourage the idea of R to decision makers who even might be unfamiliar. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much, Joshua, uh, especially uh, against the competing noise, which I think is very unnerving. If yeah, you're I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's obviously completely beyond your control. Anyway, so yeah. we're... Um, I think we're we're within time here, and we can. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I think uh, we're well within time. So I think we have scope for for comments and questions. I um, I was just going to say I, I've uh, done a small little bit of work in an infectious disease context where I saw a lot of the work was developed in high income country context. This was in relation to HPV, and then the models uh, kind of come as kind of hand-me-downs down to yeah. the low and maybe the middle-income country context and there's always this tension of having the experts based in in, in the you know the global north uh, uh, and then the models are implemented at a distance versus actually implementing them locally in the different trade-offs and obviously this is a different way of doing things is you know adding some of the detail um locally and i think that's very much to be encouraged and i also think this presentation fits in very very well with what we're trying to do with this initiative and in getting people to um the link in internationally what do you think those challenges are about um building the local expertise and especially that engagement with the decision maker that you're talking about what does what did this process illustrate to you well i mean I, what's what's interesting is the original model actually used as as you say an american a model for the history of disease on HPV. Um, and I think, so we only actually uh, created a comprehensive evidence synthesis and model on the vaccine efficacy. And then we just sampled from probability distributions um, for the parameters. Um, so st standard Monte Carlo. Um, but I think if we actually ran a full evidence synthesis on as many parameters as possible, I think the results would have been drastic um, because for example, in the, in the adopted model, the highest HPV infection rates was about, or probability was about, I think 18 or 19%. Um, whereas in South Africa, we are seeing rates as high as about 50%. Okay. Um, so I think it, it speaks to that, is that if you use context related information, it's gonna have drastic results on your more drastic results on your your outcomes yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, regarding training um i think it's i mean i can speak to the south african context it's it's very hard i mean even now with excel models um they often have to be simplified as much as possible for decision makers to to um uh accept them um, and that goes beyond just, you know, that even sacrifices in terms of trying to make the disease history as simple as possible, uh, just lots of technical compromises. Um, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's mainly about education. Again, I think this con well, this workshop has spoken also a lot to shiny app development. I think that could be a huge help 
to make it more interactive. I think when people can actually get their hands on something that helps a lot. Um, but I mean, that also goes with the word of, uh, uh, word of warning. I also believe that that, that can be very dangerous in many senses um, for, for health economists specifically to just use that for their modeling rather than actually building it. Um, yeah, um, I hope that answered your question. Okay, I see. And, uh, it, and that maybe just expand a bit on that danger. Do you think that there's a, there's a tendency for uh, oversimplification or misplaced trust in, in terms of you've flung a slider one way and there's too much trust placed in the, in the, in the output? Well, um, yeah. So in terms of, I mean, well, even with Excel models, uh, there's, it's nothing we haven't presented. I mean, I'm the only person in the health economics department, along with my supervisor, Lucy, who even touched R. Um, everyone else uses Excel or triage. Mm -hmm. um, um, so basically, uh, the point is that even within South Africa, we have to present X Excel models. But even with Excel models, they have to be very simplified. Mm -hmm. um, there's just not the infrastructure or expertise in place to accept more advanced models. Mm -hmm. I, I believe this will change quite rapidly as more people are, as we have, we develop a stronger health system um, and review expertise. Um, and I think a lot of, for example, like the biostatistics units at UST have fully adopted R. Mm -hmm. um, and I think small changes like that will definitely change things. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably a common experience sort of across a lot of countries, just maybe different countries are at a different point in that transition. I think there's probably some very interesting yeah. sort of research on diffusion. I'm, I'm just going to ask if any, are there any questions um, coming up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the chat um, uh, there for Joshua? Uh, I think that's a very uh, interesting presentation on, on the practicalities and an interesting way of making simple adaptions to, to, to find out the implications of those uncertainties. Okay, well, you've got me back on track, uh, Joshua. And thank you. Uh, and cool. Thank you, Mr. Bussell. Didn't uh, didn't take you <laughs> off track. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, super. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.